Good morning, everyone. So my talk should be a nice follow-up to Professor Salerno's. Uh, he, uh, he was talking about the evolution of the Santa Claus principle from the Keynesians and Abel Lerner through the modern monetary theory. And then we just had a, a brief preview of the MMT view from, uh, from Bob Murphy, where he said, well, I could spend a whole 20 minutes talking about this. So that's what I'm going to do, is spend my whole 20 minutes talking about that. Uh, I guess an alternative uh, title of my talk could be uh, I read this book so that you don't have to. This is uh, Stephanie Kelton's uh, book, the, Defi uh, the Deficit Myth. So uh, she has a chapter in this book called Def um, The Deficits That Matter. And in 2015, she became the chief economist for Senate Democrats on the Budget Committee. And she recounts her time and her frustration on that committee with both Democrats and Republicans because they were stuck in this mindset that uh, government deficits mattered. She decided to help Bernie Sanders, quote, flip the script on deficits in his remarks uh, when the CBO director was uh, coming to give his talk and give, and give the projections, which, by the way, uh, by 2050, those projections show uh, debt reaching 200% or almost 200% of uh, GDP and deficits reaching 10% of GDP by the same time. So it's pretty scary that the CBO is projecting that. But here's Kelton's plan, quote, I propose to the staff that we ignore the fiscal deficit completely and talk instead about the deficits that really matter. Here is what she described as the deficits that matter. She said, the deficits that we identified are the ones that affect ordinary people the most, and they have been ignored for far too long. They are what lie at the core of any decent society. Our national infrastructure is crumbling. The cost of a college education is increasingly out of reach, and 45 million Americans are saddled with more than $1.6 trillion in student loan debt. Income and wealth inequality are near record highs. Um, average workers have seen their real wages increase by just 3% since the 1970s. I wonder if there was something important that happened in the early 1970s that would <laughs> affect the rate of price inflation. Who knows? Uh, she continues, nearly one in four Americans say that they will never be able to afford to retire. Our health care system is inadequate, to say the least with 87 million people uninsured or underinsured. So she's outlined all these deficits that matter, and she's trying to deflect, uh, ignore the, the budget deficit, and look at these deficits that matter. So why would she want to ignore government deficits? She's a superstar in the MMT world. And according to MMT, uh, government deficits are an accounting fiction that distract us from the government's true ability to accomplish big things. The U.S. government is what MMTers call a monetary sovereign, so it issues its own currency and it borrows in debts that are denominated in its own currency. Since it can create money, it's not financially constrained. Debts and deficits are meaningless, therefore. They say that any attention given to the negative consequences of debts and deficits is part of an old-fashioned, outdated scarcity mindset. They go much further than that, actually. Uh, they go much much further than merely claiming that deficits are an accounting fiction. According to Kelton, their red ink is our black ink, meaning that government deficits actually represent positive net financial assets for the private sector. So when the government spends $100 and then taxes $90, it has left $10 in private hands. So free money, yay for us. <laughs> but if you take just one more step, this claim falls apart. They never reconcile this claim with the fact that uh, government debt service is paid for with taxes and money printing. The only way to extinguish government debt is by taking money and purchasing power away from the same group they claim is the recipient of the government's generosity. Bob Murphy came up with this analogy. If somebody owes you $1,000 and he comes up to you with a gun and says, give me $1,000 or I'll shoot, so you give him the $1,000, and then he turns around and gives it back to you and says, okay, my debt has been repaid, and that's not really your financial asset, but that's exactly what the U.S. government is doing with debt service. Kelton hand waves debt service away by focusing on the simplicity of the way the Fed technically makes payments. So here's what she says about debt service. Since our lawmakers have not yet had the benefit of seeing MMT's insights, they view debt service as a growing financial burden on the federal government. That's a mistake. In truth, paying interest on government bonds is no more difficult than processing any other payment. To pay the interest, the Federal Reserve simply credits the appropriate bank account. Simple as that, right? <laughs> <clears throat> to summarize, debt service is not a constraint on the government because the Fed can simply conjure up new money at will. But this misses the point entirely. Of course, a counterfeiter is not budget constrained. The question, however, is about the cost to everyone else. 
Who bears the burden of a counterfeiter spending newly created money? Who bears the burden of the Fed creating new money to pay bondholders? And the answer is, of course, everyone else. Taxpayers bear the burden to the extent that the government's tax revenues pay the bondholders. Everyone holding dollars bears the burden in the form of higher prices. Everyone in the private sector bears the burden of real resources being expropriated for uh, government projects instead of profitable and productive uh, employment, subject to the profit and loss test of the market. And so therefore the government is, is what I call the expropriator in chief. And what's interesting is that MMTers don't deny this. So they, they might not like the way that I've characterized it, but in, their, in Kelton's book and also in their documentary, Finding the Money, and elsewhere in their literature, they're always talking about the government's grand ability to command resources that are already existing in the market. So they recognize that the government is actually doing this expropriation and commanding of resources. <clears throat> so they repeatedly refer to the government as a system for democratically taking resources from the private sector and directing them into the right areas at the right time to give the people what they want. Despite MMTers saying that their theory just describes the way the world works, their literature is filled with prescriptions and proposals for the government to spend tons of money on all sorts of things. As a whole, it's a plan to turn the US government into a central planner for the whole economy. Okay, so let's take a look at Kelton's uh, deficits that matter and see what the government's track record is in managing these areas. My aim is to show you that the government, far from being hands-off in these areas, has been intervening in these areas for decades or longer, and the MMTers' ideas for even more government involvement would only exacerbate the problems. Add to this the conclusion that we've already made, which is that deficit spending does impose a burden on everyone. You can't get something for nothing. We've heard that a few times already in this conference. We'll see that not only is the government ill-equipped to solve the problems, but additional government involvement is expensive. Okay, so first up is the good jobs deficit. Kelton says that unemployment statistics don't capture the quality of the jobs people get. In a downturn, people lose well-paying jobs that match their skills, and when employment picks back up, many gain jobs that pay less and don't match their skills. A symptom of this, she says, is, quote, no less than 40% of Americans say they would, they would be unable to come up with $400 in an emergency. Kellen does not mention anything about the effect of incessant money printing on real wages or people's decisions to save. And I should point out that right after this section, there's a section on the savings deficit. And also in that section, there's no mention at all of the effect of money printing or price inflation on, on people's decisions to save. Her answer, a federal job guarantee. She says, ultimately, the good jobs deficit comes down to the way money flows through the economy. Right now, those flows grant good pay and great benefits to a small portion of fortunate Americans, and meager pay and little to no benefits to a great many more. But money, as MMT notes, is the one resource the federal government can't run out of. There's no reason every job, all the way down to retail clerk or fast food worker or janitor in a luxury Chicago hotel, can't be a good job with dignified pay, hours, security, and benefits. It must be nice to be in a position to make these you know, grand proposals and promises to people, as opposed to reminding people about scarcity. So according to MMT, no scarcity of dollars means that there should be no you know, bad jobs. We should be able to fill the good jobs deficit. But let's think about what has caused the good jobs deficit. What causes the business cycle, such that labor markets are subject to regular tumult? It's the very prescription that Kelton endorses, profligate government spending financed by money printing. I'm sure that people in this audience don't need a lesson on Austrian business cycle theory, but the MMTers should take notes on it. They, by stretching the data and logic, actually say that it's uh, federal government uh, budget surpluses uh, that cause the business cycle, that cause the ups and downs. <clears throat> it's quite a sight to see. In the correction phase of the business cycle, uh, the federal job guarantee would prolong and deepen the, the recession. As, as we're all familiar with in this room, uh, what we need to happen in, in a recession is we need for capital and labor to go to productive and profitable employment. So during the artificial boom, interest rates have been pushed low, and there's been a, a bunch of money printing that causes entrepreneurs to make malinvestments, and there's overconsumption as well. So there's a bunch of mistakes that are made during this boom period. And so what we need in the correction phase, the recession, is to find the good paying jobs, the, the right employment for all of those uh, factors of production. Okay, next up is the healthcare deficit. Kelton says roughly 28.5 million Americans still lack health insurance. Nearly one American in four reported skipping doctor visits due to costs, and nearly one in five did not purchase prescribed medications for the same reason. 
And she points out that uh, in the US, we still lag behind other developed countries uh, even after the passage of the uh, Affordable Care Act in 2010. So she realizes that even though we have the Affordable Care Act and tons and tons of government intervention, uh, that we, we already have all of that government involvement in, in healthcare, yet we still have this healthcare deficit. So she says, it's not that the US doesn't spend money on healthcare, we actually spend a lot more than any developed country. And so what's her solution? More government involvement. Actually to the point that healthcare provision is completely nationalized. The, health, the uh, federal government should centrally plan all, asso all resources associated with healthcare. She says, closing the healthcare deficit will require more primary care doctors, nurses, dentists, surgeons, medical equipment, hospital beds, and so on. To properly care for all of our people, we'll have to build more hospitals and community health centers, invest more heavily in medical research, and create an economy where training the next generation of doctors and nurses won't bury Americans in debt. And interestingly, uh, Ludwig von Mises actually has an example uh, regarding the building of a hospital by the government in his book, Economic Policy, uh, Thoughts for Today and Tomorrow. Mises says this, uh, if the government wants to do something beneficial, if, for example, it wants to build a hospital, the way to find the needed money for this project is to tax the citizens and build the hospital out of tax revenues. Then no special price revolution will occur because when the hospital, excuse me, when the government collects money for the construction of the hospital, the citizens, having paid the taxes, are forced to reduce their spending. The individual taxpayer is forced to restrict either his, his consumption, his investment, or his savings. The government, appearing on the market as a buyer, replaces the individual citizen, and the citizen buys less. But the government buys more. The government, of course, does not always buy the same goods which the citizen would have bought, but on the average, there occurs no rise in prices due to the government's construction of the hospital. So he contrasts that scenario where the government collects taxes and uses the funds to pay for the hospital with an alternative situation in which the government simply prints up new money and uses that to fund the building of the hospital. So he says, if it uses freshly printed money instead, it means there will be uh, people who now have more money while all the other people still have as much as they had before. So those who receive the newly printed money will be competing with those who were buyers before. And since there are no more commodities than there were previously, but there is more money on the market, and since there are now more people who can buy more than they could have bought yesterday, there will be an additional demand for that same quantity of goods. Therefore, prices will tend to go up. And here's the critical part. This cannot be avoided, no matter what use of the newly issued money will be. So the effects of inflation are unavoidable, no matter what the government is spending money on. So Kelton thinks that monetary inflation can be used to command the use of resources without any trade-off. So she would say that we can avoid all of those negative consequences. <clears throat> that we can get something for nothing, simply because the government is not budget constrained like a household. MMT downplays scarcity and deflects questions about the affordability by focusing on the government's budget instead of the true nature of the government's expropriation through inflation. Everything the government does comes at a cost because the government has nothing. Every resource it diverts toward political ends comes at the expense of economic ends. All forms of public finance come with distortions, taxes, inflation, borrowing. They alter uh, the way private actors would have used their own money and real resources in both obvious and subtle ways. And it's the job of the economist to be able to see through the, the, what's obvious, what's, what actually happens, and realize the counterfactual course of events, or to realize the unseen consequences of, of government's intervention. And of course, the job of the politicians and the bureaucrats and propagandists like Kelton is to do the opposite, which is to ignore, downplay, and deflect all of those uh, negative consequences that are sometimes difficult to see. I think we have time for uh, one more of uh, Kelton's deficits that matter. She says that we have a democracy deficit. The deficit between the few and the many, between the powerful and the powerless, between those with voice and those without. She claims that our political and economic institutions have exacerbated inequality, uh, giving undue rewards and power to a small class of elites. So what's her solution? Tax the rich, <laughs> because the government needs uh, th their money to not, excuse me, not because the government needs their money to fund big projects and close all of the other deficits that matter, but simply to decrease their wealth. She says, quote, taxes can be used to curb astronomical accumulations of wealth. 
That's important precisely because the wealthy use their money to amass power and influence over the political process. But confiscatory taxation is only one part of her solution. She unironically cites that fountain of economic ignorance, Robert Reich, uh, later on. Uh, she says, as former Labor Secretary Robert Reich has written, we need a slate of policies aimed at pre-distribution, at least as much as we need conventional taxation and redistribution. In quote. In short, government must centrally plan every person's income and ensure no one gets too wealthy. Of course, uh, one thing that is unsurprisingly missing in Kelton's diatribe on inequality is Cantillon effects. Printing money necessarily creates winners and losers. The first ones to receive new money are able to use it to bid up the prices of the goods and services that they want to purchase and also acquire financial assets and other uh, productive capital goods, for example. Um, and then the, the people on the outskirts, the people who receive the new money later uh, with an increase in income, or perhaps never at all, um, if they have a fixed income, they are the ones that have to pay all the higher prices in the meantime, and so they're the losers. And so what we see uh, with a proper understanding of Cantillon effects is that uh, wealth and income is concentrated uh, near the center, near the, the money spigot itself. So uh, in conclusion, uh, Kelton does not see the very policy she proposes cause and exacerbate the problems she thinks MMT can fix. She wants to increase government spending and intervention in areas the government has already caused so much damage. And it's easy to see why. When you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. When you have a blank check for government spending, everything looks like a problem more government spending can fix. When all the government can do is expropriate, and any side effects can be managed by a technocratic elite, then it's no surprise that MMT in the end advocates for statism, totalitarianism, and central planning. Thank you.